Hello and welcome to the Fish Breeder Show, a webcast covering the how-to for the breeding and raising of tropical freshwater fish. I'm your host, Tim Stanton. And I'm Jeremy Bosch. And this show provides information to achieve success in the breeding and raising of tropical fish. Any, as in any journey, there's a different way to achieve the same destination. And this is going to be true with the breeding of uh, tropical freshwater fish. And the methods described here are just one way to achieve that success. And future shows will cover tropical fish such as barbs, tetras, rainbow fish. Probably even do an episode on plants here. Today, though, we're going to focus our attention on old world cichlids. Gotcha. So let's talk about cichlids here. When we talk about old world cichlids, we're typically talking about uh, the continent of Africa, aren't we, Jeremy? Yes, we are. Mostly, uh, mostly African species. Other areas you may find old world cichlids would include Madagascar and also parts of India. And there's even um, Ivana Carr, which is uh, found in Iraq. So there are other cichlids found in other areas of the world. But primarily when you're thinking old world, you're thinking the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And then more specifically, uh, the old world uh, African cichlids are typically... Uh, in reference to the lakes in which they're found. So these would be the great rift lakes that are uh, Victoria, Tanganyika, uh, some in West Africa. Uh, you mentioned uh, Madagascar. Some very popular uh, cichlids came from Madagascar. And mm -hmm. we're talking uh, fish now that are much larger than ones we've talked about in previous episodes. We're talking about some that range from maybe an inch in size but up to three feet in length, some of the larger pike cichlids. Aren't, isn't that true, Jeremy? Yeah, there actually are some, some larger Tanganyika cichlid species found in the lakes. Um, the lakes have allowed these fish species to, to grow to uh, large sizes, and a lot of the native people will actually uh, feed on those fish because they get so big. Um, one example of that would be um, some of the haplochromuses that are found within Lake Malawi or Lake Victoria, um, and then obviously the uh, Lake Tanganyika uh, species that's really well known as Beligochromus microlepis, which is uh, the largest growing cichlid in the world, attaining sizes of three foot. Wow. Um, but we're going to turn our attention to a much, much smaller fish, almost considered the smallest of the cichlid species, and that is uh, Neolamprologus uh, multifasciatus, which is a little shell dweller species from Lake Tanganyika. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they only get about an inch, inch and a quarter in size. They can get a little bit larger in captivity. You see them getting a little bit larger, um, probably because they get uh, more, they get better food, more care. They live longer in captivity than they would in the wild. So sometimes you can see them as large as about an inch and three quarters in size. So, um, but it's a very neat species. Um, uh, they get the name of shell dweller. So, uh, Tim, do you want to discuss what shell dweller means? Sure. Uh, I think one of the important things to mention is the biotopes in which the, all these different cichlids come from. And the one that's particular to the fish that we're talking about today comes from an environment where there's a, a heavy amount of uh, crustaceans with uh, shells where the fish uh, utilize those uh, in the breeding of their fry. And uh, there is a, uh, a great book uh, uh, that talks about uh, Darwin's uh, dream lake and because of the so uniqueness of each of the different species of cichlids and uh, this is true with the uh, uh, with these uh, fish that sometimes are called shellies isn't that true Jeremy? Yes yeah they go by shellies for short um, multifasciatus also goes by multis for short too so um, you know it's an easy way to remember what the, the fish is um, it's a small fish. They have vertical barring, very thin barring uh, throughout the body of the fish. Um, usually the, the males are larger in size uh, than the females, and the males will take up a territory, and they can have several females within, within their territory, a, a harem of females, if you will, and he's free to spawn with any of those females. Um, this goes for any of the shell dwellers, as a matter of fact. Most of them adopt this um, this environment of living where they've got several shells within a territory and several females. Mm -hmm. um, other... I, think, I think one of the fun things to mention about this fish too 
is there are people such as Ad Konings, who's very popular in the hobby. He literally goes to uh, these lakes, sometimes like uh, for Maltese, found along the uh, Zambian coast of uh, Tanganyika. And he actually scuba dives and videotapes mm -hmm. them. And he's got a whole website dedicated to uh, all sorts of cichlids. But really, he does focus in on these fish as well, doesn't he, Jeremy? He does. And... Ad does a great job of showing video of of these fish as well as f photography. I mean, he's written several books on these fish. Um, another person that does a lot with these fish is Hans Buscher, who um, presented a, a video completely um, of Tanganyikan cichlids uh, when he visited the OCA, the Ohio Cichlid Association extravaganza a few years back. So it is just really neat to see all these fish in their natural environment and how they live and then try to recreate something like that in the aquarium. Mm -hmm. um, and with this species, it's it's pretty easy. I mean, they stay small, you know, an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Um, you can keep them in, you know, like a 10-gallon aquarium and have a colony of these. Um, I think it makes a really great fish for somebody that's new to cichlids even. Yeah. Um, they may not have a lot of color per se, but they've got a lot of behavior that makes up for that, and their small size I think also helps too. And I think you can bring that out in them in terms of crafting your uh, aquarium appropriately for these uh, shell dwellers. Uh, first, by using a lot of rocks. Uh, they're a, f a species of fish that is not a, a, a topwater fish by any means. They're uh, typically found in their own native environment uh, down at about 75 feet at depth uh, mm -hmm. along some of the rocky uh, depths of the uh, of the lake, uh, utilizing the old uh, large snails shells uh, in large part for the raising of their fry. So the fish don't truly live there themselves, but they do raise their fry out of it, and hence the association with being called or labeled shellies. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so you want to have a biotope that's full of a lot of rocks, as Jeremy said, to give them places to hide and swim in and out of. And I think you'll find that they become much more active if. Uh, than if you sort of provided just a barren landscape with uh, a couple of shells just thrown set in the smack in the center of your uh, glass bottom tank. I think they'll do much better in a appropriately biotoped environment. Mm -hmm. And you always want to have more shells than fish in the aquarium too. So that way if there's any sort of aggression that does appear that you know those fish can retreat into any shell that they wish that's open. Um, so that's important to do. Um, another thing, too, is if you're considering mixing these with other fish, you need to make sure that they're not going to be too large. Uh, Maltese are pretty, um, you know, they're pretty small in size, so you can't, you can't put a lot of larger fish with them. I think sure. one thing that would work really well, especially if you're doing a rocky, uh, you know, setup where you've got maybe um, a background full of rock with shells in the front on the, on the ground of the tank would be to do maybe some cypochromus um, at the surface, which are... And they're actually a cichlid, but they act more like a minnow mm -hmm. swimming in the upper reaches of the aquarium. There's not many cichlids that do that, but that is one of them. And so, you know, a tank with sip, cypochromus or sips for short, along with Maltese at the bottom, would be a, a nice display, I think. And keep in mind uh, that these fish are uh, truly a community fish where they live in uh, larger groups typically found in groups of uh, anywhere from over a dozen to two dozen fish typically in a in mm -hmm. their little community and so when you start thinking of tank environments to keep them in you want to think of larger tanks to keep the the large group in mm -hmm. and uh, th uh, think about that in addition to the biotope uh, now when it comes to breeding uh, you may want to choose a smaller tank, especially if you have them in a standard community tank, so the uh, parents aren't bothered with a lot of fish swimming in and out of their, their territory that they sort of mark for themselves. And so you may be looking at a 5 to 10 gallon tank uh, for uh, maybe uh, the, the mom and the dad. But they're also known as a harem uh, uh, breeder as well. Why don't we talk a little bit about that, Jeremy? Yeah, typically what you see in a natural environment is you've got a male and then he's going to have several females within a territory. Um, and there's no reason why you can't have that in captivity as well, uh, provided that the tank is large enough. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen 20 longs before used for Maltese before where they, um, you know, there's several males and there's several females more, you know, 
probably two or three males and then um, you know maybe a dozen females in the aquarium and their shells throughout the bottom of the aquarium and you've got fry throughout the tank as well because the, the fish are just naturally able to, to breed and raise their fry um, they're not highly predatory on their own offspring and so you end up with a tank that has a lot of motion at the bottom of the aquarium and it's a lot of a lot of fun and entertaining I think it would be really entertaining for a um, for a child uh, just to see all those little fish swimming right. around in the aquarium and um, you know it doesn't take long for them to, to reach a size where um, you can start seeing offspring up here in the aquarium and you may just one day suddenly see little babies in a shell because that's typically what happens with these guys is that once they have spawned they'll guard the, the eggs the eggs will hatch and then one day you'll just see some little babies peering out from the the entrance way of a, a shell and slowly but surely they'll over the next couple of weeks they'll make their way out of the shells feeding on you know um, various items crushed flake food works really well for them at a small size baby brine works really well right. um, so any small foods like that they're usually not problematic you can raise them up like I said right with the parents so. and I think in terms of water conditions uh, I think people just need to know these are uh, uh, Central That's African uh, cichlid. They're coming from waters that have a, a pH very similar to what would come out of people's tap. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't need extra soft water. These are not, no. uh, nor are these like black water species that come mm -hmm. from a river. These are lake fish. So we yeah. want to you know, sort of have water quality similar to that. So tap water kept in the mid to low 70s is going to be great for them. And mm -hmm. uh, really, as Jeremy said, give them a variety of sort of shells to pick as their homes and develop their own territories. And they're going to do the work for you. Uh, they're cichlids, which is what's unique about them compared to other fish where you sort of have to put them together to spawn and then take them apart. Cichlids will still continue to develop and grow. Uh, they're fry right along with them. You don't have the worries about like with angelfish or other fish, uh, even in the cichlid family where they, they're, the fry might be eaten. Uh, mm -hmm. The parents are going to raise these uh, fish, and really, I think that's what creates some of the the joy in raising these types of cichlids, isn't it true? Yeah, you get to see the parents do what they do naturally, and that's take care of their offspring. Um, something that you know correlates to humans very well because we we take care of our offspring as well. So a yeah. lot of people are able to um, you know translate that with with fish, and um, you know I think the the hardest part might be. Um, moving the, the babies out when you have too many of them, right. um, that becomes a, a challenge in itself because everybody finds the closest shell and, and they dive. And so <laughs> when you end up with too many of them, uh, then it's hard to, to split the group up because you don't know who's in which shell. And right. uh, so that makes it an interesting, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> but It's kind of fun videos to watch too. Oh, yes, it is. And I think one of the things, too, is with proper care and feeding, uh, these juvenile fish uh, that you raise uh, will reach uh, maturity in about four to five months. So mm -hmm. you can have a turnover uh, starting pretty good in terms of uh, doing a couple batches per year, uh, which means that you can uh, share them with friends and family or your mm -hmm. local uh, tropical fish auction. Uh, it's a great fish for a uh, breeder reward program based really on that, is. too. You get and, some quick points. Jeremy, what would be some references that uh, people may want to look into to learn more about these types of cichlids? Yeah, there's two two major references that I, I use typically. It's uh, cichlidae.com, which is a site that's run by Juan Miguel Artigas Azas. He's a great photographer. Um, he's got a very well laid out website dealing with cichlids, not even just this species, but any cichlid that you can really think of. Um, so I recommend his site for internet research. And then Ag Koning's book, Tanganyika and Cichlids in Their Natural Habitat, um, is a great book for anyone that's interested in learning more about Tanganyika and Cichlids. Good. Well, that wraps up today's show on uh, Tanganyika and Cichlids and the Shell Dwellers. Uh, we thank you for watching. On behalf of Jeremy, I'm Tim. And happy fish keeping, and we'll see you on our next episode of the Fish Breeder Show. <music>